It now gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker. Dr. Yaakov Hanna earned both a PhD and an MD at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, graduating in the top 5% of all Israeli medical students. Since 2007, he's been doing postdoctoral research at the Whitehead Institute, an affiliate of MIT. Dr. Hanna will join Weizmann's Department of Immunology in April 2010. An Israeli Arab born in Ramah, near the Sea of Galilee, his parents, a pediatrician and a high school biology teacher, made his education a top priority and were cru a crucial source of support and inspiration that has obviously paid off. Please welcome Dr. Yaakov Hanna. Uh, thank you very much for the kind of introduction, and I'd like to thank you more for your support and for by coming here today to listen um, on um, what I would have been doing and I would like to be continuing in my lab at the Wiseman Institute. Um, during my at MIT, um, we've been interested in studying uh, the biology of embryonic stem cells and their potential application in regenerative medicine. As you know, the average population age has been increasing, and as a result, we've been seeing a lot uh, more diseases of uh, degenerations of organs, such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, diabetes, and we've been, people have been interested in finding ways to find tools to regenerate organs. And the problems, as you know from common transplantation, is finding the appropriate source of cells to transplant and avoiding rejections of organs. Now our interest in stem cells um, is um, nothing new actually. If you, as you can see in this painting from the 15th century, it's called the Fountain of Youth, where you could see here um, the sick and the elder want to come and bathe in this fountain and go out on the other side. Uh, young, uh, healthy, and naked. <laughs> <laughs> but our take on this is to study embryonic stem cells. And as Jerry, you look here, this is every human being starts with the one cell, the egg, and starts multiplying and generate uh, in early development different stages, which we will not get into details. But I just want to say that embryonic stem cells that you see here, the cells growing in the Petri dish, are isolated from early stage embryos. Now, as you know, in development, the body gives rise to a lot of different cell types, and these ES cells, embryonic stem cells, have been important because we can grow them indefinitely in a Petri dish, and we can make them, just like in normal development, to give rise to every cell type in the body whether you can think of heart, lungs, brains, um, really every cell type. Now, ES cells are great, embryonic stem cells, as ES cells, but the problem is that when you come to patients, still you have, um, you want not to go through the hassle of finding donors and matching organs, and then you have to give immune suppressions, and the field wanted to make customized stem cells or genetically identical stem cells. And the breakthrough and the idea for this concept came by the generation of the clone Dolly, as you might know. Now, to explain what the Dolly experiment, I just want to give you the general idea that if you can think of this one cell that starts in development, the cell starts going down this hell, and it differentiates into different cell types. Now, in differentiation, the DNA sequence is not changed. If you think in my heart cell and my brain cell, the DNA sequence is exactly identical. The difference is how the DNA is packaged. It's almost like an accordion. You have one genes where the DNA is very, very tight and the gene is not expressed, and you have some areas where the DNA is very loose and the genes are expressed. And the differences, the regulation and the expression is what differentiates a heart cell from a brain cell. And this is called the study of not genetics, 
epigenetics, it's above genetics, it's a different regulation. And in development, it was thought that as the cell differentiates, goes down the hill, you get these chain epigenetic changes that were thought irreversible. But in cloning, you can take a skin cell, the nucleus, by a needle, and inject it into the egg. And what happened, that egg develops, starts dividing two cells and four cells or even more, and then give rise to a whole organism. And this experiment Dolly showed us that you can take a differentiated cell type and make a whole organism of it. Erase all the marks and go back in development. And the people thought our intent was not to make an army of clones, but perhaps we can use this to um, explore can we make identical stem cells by nuclear transfer. You could think of a scenario where you have a patient, for example, with diabetes or Parkinson's, and you want to make a biopsy, you take skin cells, take the nucleus, inject it into the egg, differentiate the stem cells that you get into dopaminergic neurons, and transplant them back. But the problem with nuclear cloning, there are a lot of ethical problems and finding embryos and finding egg donors. And what our field tried to understand, what is it that the egg does to convert the skin cell back to stem cells. And that way we can overcome and circumvent the use of embryos and the hassles with that. And the breakthrough came by discovering that if we take skin cells and we put only four genes, we can convert fibroblast cells, as you can go here. The cells start proliferating, and slowly they end up becoming cells that behave like embryonic stem cells, these round, shiny colonies. As you can see here is in comparison, the really each colony of cells has almost 100 cells of stem cells. The IPS cells, they're called induced pluripotent stem cells, are identical to the embryonic stem cells we derive from embryos. The amazing thing, if you think about it, these stem cells that we generate without using embryos, we can inject them into the de a host developing embryo and generate a whole chimera of a mouse. You can see this mouse is half brown, half black. And it goes on to give even babies that are half, some of them are brown, and some of them are black. So you can really take a whole cell converted into a whole organism. This also works in humans, the same combination. We can make, as you can see, these, that's how embryonic, human embryonic stem cells look like. And our major focus is to do two types of approaches for utilizing this technology. One is to use induced pluripotent stem cells, IPS cells, for uh, studying diseases. Now, you can think in uh, many of the diseases, such as Parkinson's or diabetes, not only where you have the neurons degenerate or you lose the insulin cells, not only is it really hard to make biopsies in humans and to get out the cells and study what happens in the disease, many times by the time the diagnosis is made, the cells are already gone. There's basically nothing to study. And what we try to do is to go to patients with different diseases, make a skin biopsy, make IPS cells that are genetically identical to the donors, and then we have a renewable source of cells, stem cells, that give neurons or insulin-producing cells in the Petri dish. And we can use you can see, for example, in ALS disease and compared to a normal person, make these stem cells in the Petri dish and compare the two and ask questions that we couldn't get at before. What is the difference between the neuro from a patient and a healthy donor? How do they behave in the Petri dish? What is the gene expression? Um, um, uh, how do they function when we stress the cells out? Can we even use um, automated screens to find drugs that could alleviate the death of these neurons? And these are the basic questions that we use this technology to ask diseases. Moreover, we can even now have technologies, as you can hear in genetic, for example, this represents um, a fragment of DNA that we can engineer, and we could actually go into these human IPS cells and replace genes out or put new genes in, and we can manipulate these cells um, and to ask basic questions about disease progression. Another type of experiments that we can use this technology is to ask, for example, in diabetes research, where you have an autoimmune diabetes, you have the immune cells 
infiltrating the tissue and destroying the beta cells. Or in cancer, you have in the beginning immune cells uh, restrain the tumor cells, but eventually they fail. And we don't really know about these immune cells in our body. Why do they fail? Or what do they attack? And why do they start attacking? And they're very rare cells. We don't know how they behave. But what we have done, developed a model that we can make a mouse, let it have, for example, the disease diabetes, and we can take out these immune cells that are in the pancreas at different stages, just give a drug to express the genes, and take, for example, immune cell, make an iPS cell, and then make a whole mouse out of that cell. And that mouse will have only one type of immune cell. The, and you could ask them basic questions. What is the difference between mice that come from immune cells in diabetes from the early stages, the late stages? You will basically rewind and let a redo of the disease and see if the disease is alleviated or uh, aggravated by different immune modulations. And again, have, get some insight into previously inaccessible windows in early disease development. The other application is obviously to develop technologies for therapeutic. And I'll describe an example for you where how we've shown a proof of principle to treat sickle cell anemia disease in mice. As you know, sickle cell anemia is a genetic disease where there's a mutation in the globin gene which carries oxygen in the blood. It's very common among African Americans. And what happens is red blood cells start breaking apart and getting this sickle shape. And you get clogging of the blood vessels and low blood counts. And um, patients can be, uh, have a lot of um, bad symptoms. And what we did, we took a mouse that has a humanized model of sickle cell anemia, basically. It has the disease, almost the same symptoms. Took skin cells from the ear, grew them in culture, expressed these four factors, the genes, to convert the cells that are to stem cells that are genetically identical to the donor mouse. And then we took out the viruses that we introduced to reduce the risk of cancer. And then we corrected, by genetic engineering, the mutation, differentiated the cells back into hematopoietic stem cells, and transplanted them back into the donor mouse to observe whether we got correction of the symptoms and these mice would recover. And just to summarize for you the experiment, we can basically just run tests that we typically do in human cells. As you can see here, this is the healthy control. And he has this peak, which represents the healthy allele of the beta globin. And you can see the mice that are not treated with sickle cell anemia have only the sickle protein, the bad protein. But after treatment, all these mice had, again, two peaks, the two types of hemoglobin. And they were basically cured from the disease. If you, for example, if you do a blood microscopy on these mice, the untreated mice, you can see all these blue cells, a lot of fractured cells, sickle cells in the blood smear. But after treatment, the cells are red, shiny, and big. And that's another parameter for alleviation of the symptoms of the disease. Now, obviously, what we're we also facing is that we need um, to be ever able to translate this to humans. We have a lot of effort to make into understanding how can we reproducibly and safely generate differentiate stem cells into all cell types in our body. How can we control it and test it, make it efficient and robust? And that's a major effort that we will be pushing. And also, we're really interested in the biology of how can you take one cell, convert it into totally a different cell type? And that's called reprogramming cell identity. For example, you can see here, we start with a lymphocyte, an immune cell that grows. We express the genes, the cells start growing in the center, grow more, and after 24 days, you can detect this green signal, which symbolizes that these are stem cells. And we want to understand what happens in this intermediate process from a biology perspective. And this is important to understand the biology, so that if we ever reach the clinic, and I'm pretty sure we will, we don't want to run into unpleasant surprises if we don't understand the biology of reprogramming. And I'm very happy to be at uh, joining the Wiseman to, that have also the technology and many groups 
to conduct a lot of these multidisciplinary experiments that we're planning to do. And I give an example here how we, when I talked in the beginning about epigenetics, how the, chromat how the DNA is packaged like an accordion, and we can use genomic tools for genomic sequencing of these different cells and during this process to understand the rules of how you convert one cell type into another. Now I hope I convince you that you know, the, the stem cell biology has a bit more than just uh, making um, offers of regeneration, even though it would be nice to have this. And I would like to thank members in my lab at MIT, especially my mentor, Rudolf Yenish, who's been wonderful in his support for the last three years, our collaborators from different um, uh, institutes, um, the Helen Hay Whitney Foundation in the US for sponsoring my postdoctoral fellowship, and um, I've, my lab in, at the Wiseman is now supported uh, by kind um, uh, gifts from the Clor Foundation in Israel and the ISF, the Legacy uh, Morasha Foundation uh, for uh, young scientists. Thank you very much for listening and be happy. <laughs>